Please be seated. So now that you have already an additional gospel reading in your mind, <laughs> um, there was an email uh, sent out to let you know the three readings that I would be preaching from today. And just in case you're someone like myself who may not have done their homework before coming to worship, I'm just going to talk a little bit about those three readings. The first is from the book of Ruth. And it's the story that we've heard many times where Naomi's decided that she's going to go back home to her own people, to her own land. Her husband has died, her sons have died, and she sends her daughters-in-law back home to be with their own people. But Ruth says, no, don't send me back. I'm going with you. Where you go, I go. Where you dwell, I dwell. Your people will be my people, your God, my God. And she goes with Naomi. The second reading is from the book of Acts, and that's the place where the disciples are preaching and teaching and things are happening and the community is growing. People are sharing meal together. They're, they're in the home, their homes in the temple. The community is growing. There's much joy among the community and, and it's growing. And la the last one is from Matthew, where the Pharisees comes to Jesus and says, what is the greatest commandment to test Jesus? And Jesus says, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. So those are the three texts that I just want to bring to the forefront of your mind today. And actually there's threads that run through the others as well. So when I was getting ready to come uh, visit, uh, I was talking with my friend, uh, a good friend of mine, about these readings. And she said, you know, the Old Testament is all about telling who's related to whom. It's telling about who was in power and who wasn't, so the priests and the kings. It talks about this hierarchy of community. So it's all about honor and status. Who was at the top of the pile and who was at the bottom? And the Old Testament, it talks and explores all of those connections and relationships. And then Jesus shows up and he just flips that all on its head. So it's about relationship, but it's not in the same way that people were imagining, the Jewish community was imagining. The one thing that I wanted, well, not one thing, many things, but what I want to start with today is, is this. So if we think about the Jewish community and the context that they were in when this gospel would have been written and read to them, it would have been a time when the Jewish people had come out of Egypt, they were back in their homeland, but they were still being oppressed. They were being oppressed by the Romans and the Roman Empire. And so there was this struggle going on about Okay, we are God's chosen people, so how is it that we are still oppressed in our own land? And there was dispute about what to do about that. Some folks thought that they should fight, and so the Zealots did just that. They rose up and they tried to fight the Roman Empire. And as you may guess, it didn't go very well. And then there was the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests, and they, they wanted to maintain their identity. So they kept themselves separated from what was going on. And they created this very elaborate way of deciding who was in and who was out. And it was all about this hierarchy. So power over. You raise up and you defeat your enemy in a worldly sense. So we're going to overpower our enemy or who's against us. Whatever it takes, it may even take violence, but as long as we feel righteous about it, we, we can claim our power over these other folks. But the same thing happens when you talk about preserving something. We are setting up the insider-outsider <coughs> thing. So we have some people who are in deciding what's going on, and then we have those who are out. So we set up this dynamic. The thing that both of those uh, camps have in common is that they're all waiting for the Messiah, the king who's going to come and save them, who's going to deliver them from their, their oppression. 
But their idea of a king and a kingdom is worldly power. So if you think right now to yourself, what comes to mind when I say king or kingdom? For me, I get the image of the crown and, you know, the high throne and the person up here who's dictating what's going on. And then, you know, it trickles on down. And eventually you kind of get to the bottom servant folks. Or maybe even some people that can't be servants, really, on the outside. But it's all about this power over. That's what comes to mind when I think of kingdom. Or it's a geographic location. It's a, it's a place. Those are the images that come to mind when I think of kingdom. And I think that's what the Jewish people were thinking as well. Right? Jesus, well, for them, the king is going to come back and restore us to our rightful place of power in society. Defeat our enemies, the Roman Empire. And you might be thinking right now, so what? What does this mean to, to me right now? But if you think about all the conversations and the things that you read and hear about all of the various denominations, all the various Christian people, the, the believers, we kind of fall into those two camps too. Some of us want to raise up and fight anybody that we don't agree with at all costs. And as long as we feel righteous about that, we may even have to resort to, you know, resort to violence. As long as we're doing it for the right, right reason. And there are those of us that want to set up this very elaborate system that keeps people who aren't quite measuring up to our standard out. So we sort of mirror what the Jewish people are going on and I think that we also still have this king, crown, and geographic location thing in mind. But if you take out the G and you just have a kingdom, and you think about kin, so I've, I've come to know that this is a word that I understand and my generation understands, but young people aren't familiar with the word kin. But if you think of kin, for me it brings an image of my daughter and her family. It brings the image of my parents and my siblings and their families and my ancestors. All of us are kin. I grew up away from my extended family, so our kin also included our next door neighbors or friends of my parents that they had met at their work or whatever. And then they and their kids, and they became our kin. People that are loving and caring for you. So it, it gets beyond this kind of blood relationship thing. So if we were to think of kin and kingdom, it wouldn't be this power over, somebody up and somebody down. It's about power with. And when we think, when I think of my kin, I don't think about who's got more or less power. We're just kin. We just care about each other. Now, I understand that my sisters who are younger, they may claim that I did exert some unnecessary power over them, <laughs> but I would have to contest that. So, you know, ju I'm just being fully transparent. But if we can get away from this idea of power over and instead have power with people, it's better for everyone. And it's what Jesus shows us and teaches us in his life and ministry. I think that one of the challenges of getting this kin, uh, kingdom king image out is that it's, it's infused. It's even in our culture. We have the people at the top and the people at the bottom. And even if you think about something in more of a horizontal plane, there are still people who are in and out. There's always a hierarchy that involves who has the power and who doesn't. And I think that's not what Jesus intended. I think that gospel brings in this new idea that's really unexpected. And it just doesn't fit what the Jewish people were expecting and what they imagined. And I think it's the same for us. If you think about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, that is not a hierarchy. That is a relationship that is dynamic and moving. It's filling, it's emptying, it's constantly in motion. And it's what we're called to be part of. We are called to be kingdom people, K-I-N. 
kingdom people. That's what God calls us to. That's what Jesus is teaching us. That's what the Holy Spirit is tapping us on the shoulder with, saying, hey, hey, what about this? What about this? It's a, it's a dynamic, moving relationship that we are called to be a part of. So if we can think about God's blessing and favor as being the foundation of the kingdom, of being kingdom people, that's where we get into this more, this right relationship, to use more theological, the right relationship, justify. And Jesus said to the Pharisee, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. God's blessing and favor is the foundation. This is the first and greatest commandment. And kingdom life is a responsive life that's always moving, seeking, looking, hearing, listening, understanding. We live in response to the foundation of God's love and mercy. So that, like Ruth, we can say, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I lodge. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. As kingdom people, we're called to be a blessing and to participate in God's vision for the world. We are called to care for those who are suffering, to seek justice, and to live with integrity. That's what kind of life we are called to. And Jesus said the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus imagines and commissions an alternative community, a kingdom for those who follow Jesus, a kingdom and kingdom living orients followers to understand that God's kingdom, it's not a geographic location, but it's a way of being and living in the world. It's a responsive life. Moving, growing, giving, receiving. It's a responsive life. And we are invited to participate with God in this amazing creation. In community, day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread together at home and ate their food, glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. As kingdom people, I believe with all my heart and soul that we are invited to participate in divine love. It just seems so enormous. How is that even possible? Someone like me could be invited to participate in this amazing thing. But if we think about something in its larger vision, this extraordinary thing, it's too much for us to take in. And I'm reminded of a, of a teaching from one of the elders in Pine Ridge, Basil Braveheart. He's a Lakota elder, and he shares the wisdom and the teachings of his grandmother, who was a traditional Lakota woman. So there's a phrase, metakyo oesi, in Lakota, and it often gets translated to we are all related, or all my relations, but it's a much bigger thing than that. It's a very sacred phrase. And it, it speaks to this idea that we're connected to all of the creation and to the creator. And that we're to live each day in gratitude. So her teaching was this, that we would wake in the morning and the first breath that we take, we are thanking the creator for giving this breath that gives us life. Right? The spirit, the breath of the spirit that fills us. We take a drink of water in the morning. We thank the Creator for this first medicine. None of us can survive without clean, safe drinking water. We thank the Creator. We live in gratitude in everything that we do and everything that we say and everything all day. We're remembering to live our lives in gratitude to the Creator. And just imagine how that could transform the way that we live and the way that we participate in community. So our ordinary bits of everyday life, a drink of water, a breath of air, all of those seemingly ordinary things strung together in gratitude to the Creator, that's how we participate in this extraordinary invitation to participate in divine love. Every moment 
of every day, lived in gratitude to the Creator. We can't go wrong. We can't go wrong. Amen.